Kevin Systrom is the founder and CEO of Instagram, the popular photo sharing service with over 15 million users. He's got a lot of great tips. Let's go talk to him. So I always like to start off with where you grew up. Like, where, where did things kick off for, for Kevin? I, uh, I grew up in a small town in Massachusetts called Holliston, Massachusetts. It's about 26 miles or so outside of Boston, right where the marathon starts. Hmm. Yeah. And so did you go to high school there? And Yeah, so I, I grew up there um, until freshman year, and then I went to private school in um, Concord, Massachusetts, which was about an hour away. And um, I was a day student there for about a year until we decided doing an hour back and forth every way it wasn't worth it. So. Was that it to your, uh, your own call on going to a private school or was it kind of forced by parents? Definitely not forced by parents. Um, I still remember, like everyone always asks me this and I try to think back about the decision to go and mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure I remember. Like I think it was kind of like an academic thing but also something new and interesting and um, it was an awesome school called Middlesex in Concord and... Um, we just did a lot of you know fun stuff, and they had cool classes in computer science, and that's awesome. Um, yeah, it was fun. Yeah, I went to a private school as well, but mine was forced. <laughs> I remember just being like, "All my new kid, and all the like neighborhood kids, yeah, were like, all the uh, public schools, yeah." And so that sucked, but well, that's cool. So you studied computer science even back then, then, right? So in, yeah. in high school, you started getting into computers. I was a huge nerd. Same yeah. here. Yeah, Big starting time. at like I remember um, starting at like twelve. I, I think like we got our first computer in the house and. I was like a Doom 2 guy. Like nice. I just Doom 2 the whole way and I would like edit levels and yep. um, that was like how I got into it actually. I'll like credit Doom 2 for, mm -hmm. for everything. Yeah, a lot of mine was like Wolf 3D and then the first Doom when that came out. Wolf 3D was like a couple of years before, yeah. I downloaded the Doom beta and where the characters didn't move yet. <laughs> And I was like running around in this world and I was blown away. Right. I mean, you remember the first time you saw like 3D environments? Oh, yeah. Like that, right? Well, Doom 2 was like the, right? It was like one of the first games that like, you know, did all sorts of graphics technology and yeah. stuff. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. So, um, so coding at that point or no? What did they teach you? Was it like Pascal or something or what did you? It's funny that you mentioned that. Actually, the first thing I learned was QBasic. QBasic. I know yeah, QBasic. Do you remember that? I yeah. can code QBasic right now. Every really? Okay. <laughs> yeah, I probably could. <laughs> I definitely could not. Um, Are you serious? It's no, so I would not though. remember at all. I can do C and all that stuff. But it was it was just quick basic, right? That's what yeah. they called it. Like it was, yeah, it was just like ten go to twenty. Yeah. Blah, you know, it's like, I still remember. I think it was like I think it was my uncle who showed it to me and was like, oh yeah, you can do this thing. Because what I really wanted to do was ask people for their password, and I had to guess the password, and then it would say you guess the password. That was the first program I wrote. That's funny. Yeah. I did some choose your own adventure, text choose your own oh, adventure stuff. You're way more advanced than I am. Dude, so. I, I don't know about that. Um, so cool. So you into computers and, and were you into like BBSs or online stuff then? Or what, how did, at what point did you like start playing around with the internet? Yeah. Uh, we had Prodigy in our house. Prodigy was like, you remember, like yeah. the counter CompuServe, to AOL. CompuServe, Prodigy, AOL, those are the three big I ones. I think we had CompuServe and we had Prodigy, but like all the cool kids had AOL and I still remember being on Prodigy and, um, but it was fun. I, I, you know, there were chat rooms and stuff, but that got me connected to the internet. But mm -hmm. um, I think like, the internet really started for me when we got AOL finally and we used to make these programs to like, you know, I got in so much trouble because you would like make the programs in Visual Basic to like boot other people offline. And Dude, everyone has this story. Is everyone? Who else yeah. did we talk to about the Dennis Crowley, right? From, he was telling mm -hmm. us about like AOL hell, there was yeah, this program that. to boot. Dude, everyone yeah. has the same story. It's yeah, I can't remember the names of all of them, but I think that's because everyone had like a password you had to enter in order to use it. And right. that's why you learned QBasic because... That's so aspect. funny. Yeah. yeah. Seriously, I think that spawned an entire like generation. It totally did because it got you excited things. about like this secret little underground and like these there were hacker tools available yeah. and yeah. You used to like you know spit out IMs where it would like make you know ASCII text and art. Yeah. Stuff. Yeah. I remember the ASCII text stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was cool. But I, that really got me into you know computers and the internet. And b by the way, at that time the internet was not like web pages and apps. It was like keywords and AOL and mm -hmm. chat, right? Totally. It was very, very early. And, um, you know, only, you know, as we approached high school did, you know, I start really doing programming. Mm -hmm. I was like very much Q basic and visual basic. And then um, getting to high school, I remember just taking so many computer science classes. And actually in high school, uh, they waived my requirement of doing biology. I still to this day haven't taken a biology class. Amazing. 
because they were just like, yeah, just do computer science. And I remember in my application to Stanford, I had to like call out why I had not taken human biology and um, it was a big deal. But. So then you went to apply for Stanford and got yeah. accepted there. Mm -hmm. I am. Um, it's actually strange. I don't remember why we came out to the West Coast. I think my parents had been out to the West Coast and they're like, oh, you'll love it out there. And, um, you know, came out and toured a bunch of places in California. I was like, there's no way I'm going to school on the East Coast. I was like mm -hmm. done with winter, done with gray Januarys. And what were you considering then? Like, uh, like Cal Poly? <sighs> no, I was in big tech school I, as well, right? Like, I went to, um, I saw UCLA. I saw, uh, Harvey Mudd. Do you know what Harvey Mudd is? No. It's the engineering school. Um, you know, oh. outside of LA. Yeah, yeah, I know what you're talking about. But um, <clears throat> Caltech, which was mm -hmm. really interesting, um, and Berkeley and Stanford. And I applied early at Stanford and got in there um, very luckily. But Tell know. me about the environment at Stanford, because that's, uh, I mean, it's known as one of the best tech schools, if not like the best engineering school, right? Would you say that? That's yeah. True? Um, you know, I don't know what the rankings are these days. Like SATs no longer add up to 14, 1600. Right? Yeah. See, it shows how much I got, right? Um, but I think that Stanford is like one of the best places to meet engineers who are also really well-rounded people. Like the only place I've been on earth that you can meet someone who's like extremely smart, but also can like lead a team of people. Right. Hmm. Um, and the environment at Stanford was very hardworking. They used to like describe it as like a duck, like on the surface, you seem pretty calm, but underneath you're working really hard. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, I, the first class I signed up for was computer science at Stanford, and it was called CS 106 X. And the X was for like extreme. It was supposed to be like the entire year compressed into one quarter. Um, and needless to say, like coming in as a freshman, I, you know, just very quickly realized how hard, you know, it could be. But um, we uh, worked really hard, and I, I remember getting not a great grade and looking around and being like, well, I guess computer science isn't for me. Um, but I still remember everyone in that class. And actually, one of the people in that class works with us today on Instagram. Oh, really? Yeah. Awesome. It really comes around. But I mean, great, intelligent people who are, work really hard. And a lot of entrepreneurs come out of there, yeah, too. Yeah, absolutely. It's one of the, uh, the best. I, I've heard of like farms to try and find great talent. You know, people are always trying to figure out ways to get to the students at Stanford before they graduate and right. line them up for a job at, you know, Google or Apple or wherever it may be. Um, so... You know, you graduate, you got your degree, you got your bachelor's in... Uh, management science and engineering, okay. so not computer science. Oh, okay. I, at some point along the way, I had decided that um, it made more sense to focus on, like, managing a company. So I did this management science uh, major. But you still had two, three, two years of uh, yeah. coding? Well, I mean, the, the real trick is that uh, the entire time I was at Stanford, I kept coding on the side, um, just not taking the classes. Gotcha. And I made... Um, I tried to make a competitor to Craigslist that serviced only uh, Stanford students. And that actually turned out really well. And we got a, like 8,000 of the however many people at Stanford. We got to sign up and um, it was great. And that was like my first kind of touching, you know, with uh, social startups. Mm -hmm. And that summer I ended up working at Odeo, um, which obviously went to become Twitter. But um, it was like my first taste of what entrepreneurship was. Hmm. So uh, how did you get the job at Odeo then? <laughs> I was uh, studying abroad in Florence um, one quarter, and uh, it was the dead of winter. And I still remember um, the house I was in had like giant cement walls and had no Wi-Fi. Like Wi-Fi wasn't a thing that existed that much, you know, in, in Italy at the time, at least. And um, you, you know, had to go to the library to get Wi-Fi, and there was a library right around the corner. So I remember looking for an internship for that year and going outside in the snow with my laptop next to the library and like looking for startups. And uh, Odeo was on the front cover of the New York Times website. Mm. And I was like, oh, this sounds cool. This F guy sounds cool. So I went to outside, mind you. Um, I, this is like the best hack in the world, by the way, going to who is and like looking up people's email addresses. Right. So I found Ev's email address that way and shot him a note, like sitting on the side of um, the street in Florence That's and crazy. yeah, exactly. And I, you know, didn't hear anything back the first time, but a couple more, you know, emails, um, he was like, all right, like we'll talk when you're back. So that's how I, uh, got in touch with him. And, um, it actually, you know, ended up working out really well and had a great time with those guys. Awesome. And so, um, what was it like in your, give me a little bit of your background of your experience at Odeo, because here's a startup that, you know, was founded, 
uh, by Ev Williams, who had created Blogger before. Right. And this is it was kind of his second big startup, right? Um, were you there when things weren't going so well and they decided to turn it into Twitter or were you, had you already taken off by that point? I had or was it just a su summer internship? Was that it? Yeah, it was a summer internship. Okay. So I was there for like three and a half months and um, I got to see it launch and uh, the team grow from, I think it was like four or five people when I got there mm -hmm. to, I think it was like 15 when I left or something. Um, so that's some good experience to be able to sit in. Oh, how, it was how great. How important do you think uh, internships are? Do you think like that's something you'd recommend to... <sighs> people looking to break into kind of this scene? Totally. Um, it's, you know, you're not worried about your livelihood. You're not worried about getting a job that impresses your parents, right? Like all the stress is gone. It's, it's a, you know, three month date with a startup. And if you as, you know, an entrepreneur can pitch yourself as something that's going to be super useful and not a liability, but instead like, listen, give me something to work on for uh, three months. I'll make your life easier. Is that what you said? You're just like, I'll take any task. Yeah, anything. I was me. like, I kind of program, like, you know, I do, you know, some of this entrepreneurship stuff. We were learning entrepreneurship at the time um, as much as you can learn it. But, um, you know, I basically pitched myself as like, listen, how can I help? And um, I think that's the best way to do it as an entrepreneur and as a intern, especially. Mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, you don't have the experience of, you know, an engineer of four or five years that's going to scale a service, but right. you can do anything you can to help out. So Just whatever uh, grunt work. Or yeah, anything, yeah, exactly. Like the best work I think is, is that grunt work because like what I do day, like after day at Instagram is that stuff, right? Like, um, building a startup is one of the hardest things you'll ever do, as you know, right? Absolutely. Um, and it's not all glory and it's not, you know, you're not doing great stuff all day and, um, it takes a lot of hard work and I think an internship is like a fantastic way to learn some of that. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, you spent three months there, you go back to school at that point, finish up the degree. Yeah. I'm sure you were being heavily recruited at that point, right? Like most grads Well, it's funny because are... like that summer, um, we, we toured, so I was part of this thing called the Mayfield Fellows Program at Stanford and it's like 12 students every year to like learn about entrepreneurship. and. Mm -hmm. Uh, that summer I was doing my internship at Odeo and one of the companies called Uma that is, I, I think they're still around doing, you know, VoIP stuff. Um, I met Sean Parker and a couple of people from Facebook and they were like, you should talk to Facebook. And I still remember that summer talking to Facebook and be like, should I drop out of school? What year was this? Uh, sorry? What year was this? Oh, let's not get into that. I know where this conversation is <laughs> going. Uh, it was 2000, um, it would have been 05. Yeah. This has been a good time to join Facebook. <laughs> right, I know. Well, I mean, listen, uh, I remember talking to them and um, thinking it was awesome. And there so was did this... you meet with Zuck and everything at yeah. that point? Yeah, yeah. Um, it was the decision, like, listen, I, I was not unique. Like, there were a lot of kids from Stanford getting, you know, heavily recruited there. Mm -hmm. But I was like, oh, well, you know, maybe I'll just go and graduate. And I, th I still look back um, at that experience and I think, like, forget Facebook for a second. Um, giving, like being given the opportunity to go work for a startup um, without much risk at all, because I could have always gone back to school. Mm -hmm. um, I've learned so much in doing this startup at Instagram that I never learned at school. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not saying you should drop out of school. I'm more just saying that I think that would have been the opportunity of a lifetime for learning. Yeah. Um, and that's why I think, you know, internships are so important as yeah. well. But uh, yeah, I was... It was crazy, but I, you know, anyway, like I ended up taking a job at Google um, after I graduated. And what role did they hire you for? Uh, I was called associate product marketing manager. Wow. Yeah, it was. That's not, that's, that's not really programming then, right? No. Or they require their marketing managers to program as well. I'll tell you, like I, I remember applying, and I applied for the product manager job that I really, really wanted, mm -hmm. and then I applied for the marketing job, which I was like, okay, cool, like I have a lot of marketing experience, um, but like. I want to do this product thing. Where did I love you get your marketing products. experience from? I, uh, I did a bunch of internships at like an ad agency okay. on the Truth campaign, that anti-smoking campaign. Mm -hmm. um, and my, you know, mom has always been in marketing, so I've done stuff, uh, you know, in high school. And, mm -hmm. um, and then in college, I did a lot of marketing stuff too. But besides the point, I really wanted to do the product manager job, but they were like, you don't have a computer science degree. So um, I don't know if they still have that requirement, but. Uh, I was, you know, hugely bummed out that I couldn't do that. And I actually got an offer from Microsoft at the time for much, much more doing product management. Um, but there was something about the Valley and something about Google that I really wanted to be part of. And I ended up really loving the marketing job. I can't imagine going to work for Microsoft. <laughs> well, you know, they were, I had a couple friends working for them and 
Were they having um, fun though? Or I don't know. Like, ah, think, we work in Microsoft. No, I think uh, I was actually, I it's funny because I was interviewing at um, their, for their photos group and they were going to do this really cool um, like photo technology. And uh, I remember meeting with all them and actually being really impressed. But, uh, you know, for girlfriend reasons and stuff, I wanted to stay in the Bay Area. Mm-hmm. And um, that would have been a Seattle move then. Yeah. 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 So, uh, you know, you eventually leave Google and you start your, your first startup. So what, I mean, how many years at Google and then when did you decide sure. like, hey, now it's time to, to leave? Well, you know, like I was talking about, I was doing um, <clears throat> the associate product marketing manager job and I worked on Gmail and calendar and docs and spreadsheets and actually learned a ton about like, how do you talk about products? Like, how do you make products make sense to people? And um, I ended up uh, moving to a group called Corporate Development, the a group that buys all the companies at Google mm-hmm. um, and invests in companies. And I decided that um, after about a year of doing that, I saw so many entrepreneurs having tons of fun starting companies that I actually jumped to a company started by some Googlers. Uh, it's called Next Stop. So I was there for about a year. And when I got to Next Stop, I was like, I want to learn to program again. Mm-hmm. And I want to cut my teeth and I started as a marketing guy and worked my way. Like at the end, I was uh, basically a full-time engineer working on marketing problems. Awesome. Yeah, it was really, it was cool and it was a great opportunity. And, and that's when I decided to start uh, Bourbon, mm-hmm. um, which ended up becoming Instagram. So talk to me about, you know, I'm really curious about Bourbon uh, because I heard about it and I remember Daniel Burka had downloaded it and tried it out or something, but I never got a chance to play with it before it became Instagram. Right. So what was the initial idea? Um, and, and how did you go about raising money on this idea? It's a really interesting <clears throat> story because I um, I was the only one at Bourbon and it was a check-in app. It was basically, you know, I won't sugarcoat it. It was a competitor to Foursquare at the time and it was all HTML5 so you didn't need to download it. You just visited bourbon.com and, uh, and immediately you had this thing in your web browser that looked like an app and you could check in. Um, and so would you do it from your, your, could you do it also on the desktop as well or? I, I guess you could if you like But it was meant Safari. for mobile use. Yeah. yeah. So you, um, you opened up, you know, mobile Safari and you typed in bourbon.com and it was like, boom, it looked like an app, acted like an app. Um, you could check in and as part of that, you could do two things. Um, you could post videos and you could post pictures. Mm-hmm. And, uh, I remember sitting with, um, Steve Anderson, who was our first investor from Baseline Ventures, sitting with him at the Grove in, um, in the marina. And he, you know, was like, oh, like, you know, I hear you have this thing, bourbon. And I was really nervous. I was like, I'm meeting with an investor. Um, and I had this thing set up, actually, that text messaged me every time someone joined. Mind you, uh, today on Instagram, we have two people per second joining. So at the time, it was a scalable thing. Right now, it's not, right? Right. Um, it is. You're just, your data plan would be... Right, exactly. <laughs> I actually moved to unlimited text because of that. So, <laughs> so you're fine there. Yeah, I'm okay. Um, I just can't get to sleep at night. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I was sitting there and I remember talking to him and pitching him the idea of, of this thing and showing him. And it literally would text me like every... This was like a Sunday. So it would text me uh, like once every five minutes. And some of those people he knew. And he was like, all right, there has to be something here. Some of these people are signing up. And I left there with a commitment from him being like, listen, I'll put in 50K, we're gonna do this. I remember going home and calling my parents and being like, I'm gonna do this thing. I'm gonna be a, you know, I'm gonna be in a startup and we're gonna do this thing. And um, I was like, 50K, that's like, you know, a whole bunch of funding and I'm mm-hmm. gonna be able to do this for years. And um, long story short, in talking to a bunch of people, I got enough people excited that uh, they wrote a check for a half a million. and. Um, you know, worked on bourbon and, and right as we got funding, um, I was lucky enough to find, uh, my awesome, awesome co-founder Mike, um, who is very much like the backbone of our company today. And we started bourbon together and, um, and we worked for about eight, no, it was like six or seven months on bourbon until we decided to do Instagram. But Mm -hmm. it all came back to what I said before, which was people loved posting photos, Mm -hmm. uh, and we were so undifferentiated in the check-in space that we were like, let's focus on one thing. And that ended up being, you know, photos. And obviously that turned out pretty well. Yeah. I'm curious as to, you know, was that a tough conversation to have? I mean, it was just the two of you, right? When you decided to make that switch. So, I mean, did you guys go out and have beers and say, hey, this check-in thing just is, it's too saturated. This isn't working. We actually had so many people using the service by so many, I mean like 80 
but they were all our close friends. And they were all like, we love bourbon. Don't ever stop doing bourbon. Um, but I just couldn't bring myself to feel that it was going to be the thing that won. And we had a, like a couple month process with Mike getting a visa because he's actually Brazilian um, where, you know, I was just kind of working on bourbon and waiting for Mike's visa to go through. And the day he joined, we sat down and I was like, I think we have to do photos. Mm -hmm. I remember the look on his face being like, I just joined this thing bourbon. I left my job right. and now we're going to do something else. Um, and we actually worked on a prototype for about a week when he joined. Um, and I, I wish, I think we have the code somewhere. It's terrible. Um, and after a week we decided there's no way we're doing photos because this is a terrible app. Um, and we just hated it. It was awful. And we went back to building bourbon and, um, we revisited the idea like maybe a month or two later because we were like, there's something to photos that keeps drawing us back. And, mm -hmm. and the kicker really was in Mexico. I was on this, you know, short vacation cause I was like, I have to clear my head. And I was with my girlfriend. Um, and we were working on photos and she was like, you need to make my photos look as good as all of those guys. And Greg, one of um, our engineers and a very close friend takes these awesome photos with things like Hipstamatic and mm -hmm. camera bag. And mm -hmm. she was like, I, I don't feel like my photos look that great. Right. So you have to build that in somehow. And anyway, Mike and I decided to build filters in over that vacation. And, mm. um, we came back and the first filter ever was X pro two. And, uh, Needless to say, like that really helped us take off because it meant that everyone could take beautiful photos. Yeah, absolutely. I think that that was the, the big thing for me. I, I had actually, as an angel investor, had met with a handful of startups around that time. Um, one, I can't remember the name of it, Tree something? Treehouse, yeah. Is it Treehouse? Mm -hmm. They were just doing photos, right? Right. And mm -hmm. I remember sitting down and meeting the guy, really great dude. And I looked at the photos and I, and I was playing around with it and I was scrolling through and it was something similar where you could take a photo and it would share with your friends. Yeah, it was exactly the same. And I, look in, I was looking through a few people that had signed up that I knew and it was like these really crappy photos. It was just standard flash hits food, you know, or whatever it may be. Flash it, hits food, yeah. You yeah. know what I'm talking about. Yeah, exactly. Flash hits food, nothing good comes no, out of absolutely. that. No, absolutely. It looks like crap. Yeah. And so I remember looking at that and just being like, I can't, I can't invest in anything like this because it's just, it's not really compelling to me. And then I remember you were the first person I saw that tweeted out something Graham was, that was Instagram. And I was like, whoa, Graham got his own domain name. I thought, like, <laughs> honestly, Instagram was his, his domain. And I saw it. Come on, Toast. Um, he just wants to play Tug of War. Yeah, of course. Uh, and I remember thinking, like, wow, this, I feel like I'm a professional photographer. And so do you think that, I mean, that must be the key feature, right? That is the one thing that really set you guys apart, where everyone was like, wow, not only is this quick to share with friends, but I also am making my pictures better than with the, the standard camera. Yeah, um, we set out to solve three problems with Instagram. The first was uh, we hated all the photos we were taking with the normal camera. Mm -hmm. It wasn't that they were bad, they were just, I guess the word is uninspiring. Mm -hmm. Remember at the time I owned a like iPhone 3G, so this isn't, we're not talking iPhone 4S, we're not talking right. gorgeous lens. Um, it left something to be desired. And uh, to a certain group of people, like we saw, you know, you look at the charts, we did our, you know, our business school, um, you know, research, we looked at the charts in photography and the entire top 10 apps of free photography were all like filter apps of some kind. Why didn't they add social to Right, this? so like, I remember sitting down and being like, well, I want a place to share our photos. And we saw, we saw Treehouse, and it's funny how like the people you think are gonna be your competitors at the beginning, are, like her. are yeah like very different than the competitors now and you looked at and i mean honestly like treehouse was working on a very hard problem and there are plenty of people before that that tried to solve the same thing i think the startup called radar um like everyone was trying to solve social mobile photos right mm -hmm. i think the key was like how do you make people want to share on your network versus every other network in the world, mm -hmm. right? Including Facebook, including Twitter, like what sets you apart? Mm -hmm. And I guarantee you every person that signed up for Instagram on that first day thought it was a filter app and that's it. Mm -hmm. But what we did was we bootstrapped uh, the social network by allowing you to do the filters you wanted to, which in my opinion at the time, definitely were some of the best filters out there. And I think uh, that drew people to it. And uh, I still think they're the best yeah, yeah, yeah. out I, there. I think we've built on top of it, which is awesome. But at the time, like we had very basic filters. We had some terrible ones that we got rid of. But um, 
needless to say, like people got drawn to this because they were like, wow, like all of a sudden, not only can I take awesome photos, but I can share them. So that was the second problem. We wanted to allow you to share across multiple networks all at once. Mm -hmm. And the third one was like every single app we used before, it was like an eternity to take a photo and upload it, an eternity. And the one simple thing we did was like, while you were choosing a filter and filling out the caption, we started uploading it in the background. And you clicked mm -hmm. done after you know uh, entering a caption, and then it was like, boom. So it was only it was only uh, once you start putting in the caption, right? Because right, right. you have to ch choose a photo exactly for, uh, filter first. Okay. Yeah. So while you're doing all this work, mm, right. uh, We upload it in the background, and everyone was like, "How did you make that thing upload so fast?" Yeah. And like, wasn't we just hid all the, uh, you know, the slowness? Yeah. So how much of the popular page do you think? Played into like the the social and the, and the tagging of, of photos yeah. and discovery, and he's wanting to play. <laughs> um, what what he's uh, bored. Yeah. What, what do you think? How much of that is, is is actually how much does that even get used out of sure. the average Instagram user? How many actually go over to the popular? Yeah. So um, initially, the popular page was the key, right? It was like filled with uh, people because remember, like Instagram at the time was like. 25,000 users the first day, but it was the place to find out that you could follow anyone from around the world. Even if you didn't have a friend on the service, you could find someone to follow mm -hmm. on this page. I've used it actually a lot. There's a, I follow a lot of uh, uh, Japanese dogs. Right, yeah, that's and, right. I always see you liking all the poodles, right? Uh, we didn't have to bring that up. Yeah, but, no problem. Um, Nothing to be embarrassed yeah. about. No, they're, they're cool. They're breathtaking poodles, but they, um, they, they don't too. speak any English. And so the entire thread that I'm looking at is all in Japanese. Yep. I have no idea what to say. And I'm just like, oh, cute dog, hee hee. And then that's like my, my <laughs> contribution to it. But like, it's cool that you can like friend these people and, yeah. and have, don't even have, you know, the language in common, which is pretty awesome and unique. It was probably, in many people's um, opinions, uh, they think that Instagram was like one of the first truly international social networks. Mm -hmm. Because like the second you go on there, you can communicate with anyone via like a like, right? right. Um, and even if you, they leave a Japanese comment on your photo, which definitely happened early on for me, right? Mm -hmm. um, there was something there because you were communicating via photos and imagery, right? Mm -hmm. That wasn't the case on Twitter, wasn't the case on Facebook or any other social network for mm -hmm. that matter. And that really said something to us, which was like this thing can function even if people don't speak the same language. Mm -hmm. and that added to like the escape velocity mm -hmm. really of our initial you know month was that anyone anywhere in the world could use it and it allows you to explore like new lands and new cuisines and yep. all different types of things. it's pretty cool yeah so um you know you launch this app you get it out there you get a 1.0 you got some filters you have a lot of marketing background did any of that play into the success of the application or was it just purely based on the features that you had developed? Uh, I think it was a combination of both. Um, How did you market it? What, what, it, what, what it, like, really made it take off? So I wish I could show you. I have a screenshot somewhere um, of my drafts, in bo or my drafts box in Gmail and I literally had like 30 emails queued up that say hello from Instagram in the subject and it's like tailored to everyone in tech, like literally everyone, um, you know, Gruber, you name it. And I looked in our press kit the other day and we had like a one sheeter and a PDF that explained what we did. And um, I emailed each and every one of them thinking like, maybe we can get them on our beta or something. And surprisingly to us, about half of the people wrote back. Um, and once we sent it to them, everyone loved it. They were like, this is awesome. I'm having so much fun. And the key was we let you share out to Twitter. Mm -hmm. So. You know, Jack, who, Jack Dorsey, who I knew from Odeo, I was like, Jack, I haven't talked to you in a while. We're doing this thing. If you want to use it, um, here you go. And um, he tweeted out, and I still remember seeing our wait list like climb every single time. So you had a wait list. How did that yeah, work? We, had, we just had a little like, put in your email. We'll send you a note when we launch. And uh, I think it had like maybe 5,000 names on it when we launched. So not a ton, but um, I remember like going after people who were, you know, big in design and photography on Twitter and saying, here, use this app. And mm -hmm. I don't think every app can just do this, but I think what you have to do is find an app, uh, like find a crew that like loves what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And it just so happened that they loved the product and would tweet out about it. And it created this tension of like everyone who wanted this app that couldn't get it because it was, in, it hadn't launched yet. Mm -hmm. 
That's brilliant. They actually not launching is a good thing. So we did something similar with Oink, mm -hmm. but we launched and then had the wall. And so all these people would go and install it. They couldn't that. get in and yep. they go and give it a one star review. Yep. And I'm just yep. like, oh my yep. God. Whatever. But the, I mean, those are the things we learn <clears throat> from, right? Yeah. Like not, you don't, you never do everything right the first oh, time. Absolutely. And it's, the, um, it's those experiences, right? That, yeah. And you're never, ever going to get it right. No matter how many years you've been in the business doing this kind of stuff. <laughs> like it's always... You're gonna find some way to screw I, I things up. I feel very lucky that so far we've um, we've managed to do a lot of things exactly at the right moment, exactly at the right time, with the right combination of things. And um, you know, as much as entrepreneurs want to take credit for each and every little decision and say it made complete sense at the time, I promise you, a lot of it is luck. Mm -hmm. um, but you make your own luck by working really hard and mm -hmm. um, trying lots and lots of things. Yeah. Um, so tell me about um, how big is Instagram now, user base wise? Uh, over 15 million users, which is really exciting for us. That's insane. Yeah. So um, any other service out there on the market today, I would say that has that many users. Like, and I'm assuming a lot of those are still active. Obviously, mm -hmm. uh, you said 15 million. Over 15, yeah. Over 15. Registered users. I mean, you're probably a team of 30 people, 40 <laughs> people. I mean. Any other service out there around that yeah. size, that would not be crazy. Yep. That might be a little small. Yep. How many people total are you? Uh, we are just now 10. 10. Yeah. But for the longest time, like up to like 10 million, we were like five. How, how do you, so talk to me about your definition of like lean startup and why you decide to keep, I mean, there must be, there's obviously more than, than you can handle right now. You're growing like crazy, scaling issues, you know, all these press opportunities, like, there's just so much to do. How do you do it with 10 people? Um, hire really, really smart people. Really smart people. And you take your time? Are, are you one of the, there's two different mindsets I've found. It's like, there's people that hire fast and are quick to fire. Yeah. Or do you take your time and make sure it's really a right fit, both culturally and, and technically? Or? You know, I mean, I'd be lying to say that we were doing anything except for the latter, right? But um, I think what we've realized is that you find really smart people with a lot of potential and you put a lot of trust in them. And that's why, you know, over the last month and a half, we've doubled the team from, it was like six to, you know, now 10, right? Mm -hmm. um, we are growing, I think, because we're learning that to accomplish, you know, the grand vision of what we want Instagram to become, it's, it's not gonna be like Mike, you know, Kevin, Shane, and Josh around a table of, you know, four uh, in the middle of a room trying to hack late into the night, right? right. Um, that worked for a while and probably too long and um i think it's it's i mean you, you just said before we started taping that if your phone starts vibrating too much you have to <laughs> you have to get up because you might have servers on fire or something yes, like that it's true i actually like i still uh yeah i mean a lot of i mean my, you have 15 million users and you're like yeah. the only one on call and no, no, no 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 we're all on call and um, but we, uh, I definitely wake up. Um, I've missed a lot of birthday parties. I've missed a lot of dinners. Um, I, yeah, I you mean, bring your laptop with you. Bring your. Oh little yeah, wifi. I mean, you were the one who was like uh, early on. We were talking about having all these server issues, and you were like, "Just get some MacBook Airs, get some like Wi-Fi things." Well, and, that's because we, and were we did it. It was the Samovar. best thing ever, by the way. We were sitting in Samovar, and I remember you guys like had bad cell phone servers or something, and you're like, we're "Well, the servers out. might be up or down." I'm like, "You guys need like." <laughs> Like a backup here. Right. You need to get online. We um we took your advice though. <clears throat> Best advice ever. And to this day, we have those little Mac Airs that awesome. are the thir you know the little ones, the eleven inches or whatever. Yeah, those are great. And um, they are amazing because it means that anywhere we are, and I tr I promise you, we've been in some weird places fixing stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, anyway, so we have a small team, and it means that we all have to be on call, and we probably lose a lot of sleep over it. But um, it really means that. We focus on building product and the right features at the right time, and mm -hmm. definitely means that things like Android, you know, are taking longer than they would otherwise. Um, you developing that in house and web, yeah, yeah, and uh, but at the same time, I think had you asked me when we started, had you asked anyone when we started where we'd be a year out from launch, no mm -hmm. one could have predicted the wild success and growth of what we've had so far. And for that, we're humbled. But at the same time, we don't try to second guess our strategy. Um, what we do instead is we say, like, what's the best point from here on? And mm -hmm. we focus on, like, how do we grow the team to become, you know, the world changing company that we want to be? Because we have so much to do. And um, if you look at where we're going and the, you know, the growth and 
like you know two users per second or something it's it's crazy and you it's need crazy. a lot of people to support that so. yeah so so you mentioned <clears throat> you this grand vision and where you want to take things uh you know a lot of people look at instagram they're like this is my favorite way to take fun filters and share it with friends right what's the grand vision that's bigger than filters and just sharing simple photos with friends right so uh i think you alluded to it a little bit before when you said you could explore the world right Imagine a service that collects all of the visual data that gets produced all around the world, right? So that you can tune in to any place on earth and see exactly what's happening, whether that's, you know, a friend's birthday party that you're missing, a wedding happening that you didn't, you know, go to, or a riot breaking out overseas, or something as personal as like a baby's first steps, right? Mm -hmm. These are all moments that are happening around the world um, and that we capture with our cameras, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and that's a visual media that, you know, before was sitting on someone's camera phone and just sitting there. Mm -hmm. What happens in the world when you take all of that data and you combine it in a network, right? All of a sudden... Whether you, they know each other or not. Whether they know each yeah. other or not. So I'm, I'm at the football game the other night. There was probably, you know, uh, 49ers game. There's right. probably, you know, a couple thousand people taking Instagram photos. But no common tag. But you had the timestamp, yep. you had the GPS coordinates locked yep. in the photo. You could bundle those together and make some way to visually disc browse yeah. through that stuff. Right. So, I mean, imagine being mm. able to tune into anything on Earth, right, mm -hmm. whenever it happens. So tune in sounds like video. Uh, it could be video, right, in the future. But that's why I describe us as uh, visual media, because at the end of the day, um, it is about beautiful imagery, but it, it's really more about like useful imagery, right? Mm -hmm. And useful can mean beautiful, it can mean entertaining. Um, and that's really what it's about is it's like, how do you take all the visual data from around the world and bring it to one place and what do you make of that, right? Is it your way to get news now, right? Like, is it your way to share things with friends? Is it your way to experience the events you wouldn't have otherwise? Mm -hmm. um, for instance, I follow Banana Republic and Burberry, right? Like it's a new way of shopping, right? Because all of a sudden you're seeing things and products That's coming by, cool. right? Yeah. Uh, Audi, like I get to follow Audi's cars as they get launched, right? That car shows and stuff. They're taking photos of like R8s and and crazy things. Like it's a, it's not simply about you know a, a latte and some art, right? Uh, mm -hmm. It's it's more than that because I can experience things from all different vantage points and. And that's why I think you know what we're doing is so extremely impactful in the long run, because it's a universal medium that allows you to explore the world, and and that is something that the world's been asking for for a long time. That's awesome. So how does that, how does that does that write on top of of Twitter? Do you continue to always write on top of Twitter, or, or do you eventually displace part of what Twitter's trying to do? Well, so to me, like, and we have a lot of great friends at Twitter. Like, I think we share a lot of DNA. Like, we're in the same family. Um, but it's kind of like two twins that do very different things, mm -hmm. right? Um, Twitter, I think, is an information network. It's a great place to get, you know, news, breaking news, right? It's a great way to keep up on people's thoughts, right? It's mm -hmm. like, um, you know, in many ways, what people used to describe as microblogging. Instagram isn't about, like, how you're feeling or what you're thinking. Like, I think, like, a while back, the box used to say, like, what are you thinking or something, right? right? Um, yeah. Like the box on Instagram isn't what are you thinking? It's like, what are you doing? Or like, you know, where are you? Or what are you seeing, mm -hmm. right? And, um, you know, only a small percentage of her photos actually get shared out to Twitter and things like Facebook, um, which to us really signals that people are finding a very different and disparate home on Instagram um, that is in no way, you know, a replacement for any of the other services mm -hmm. that you have, but is creating I, I a new vertical. I'm, I'm, that, that matches my behavior quite well. Like I yeah. still use Twitter for Twitter, Facebook for Facebook, and you sit somewhere in the middle there. Um, and no one knew, by the way, that that opportunity existed. Right. I remember oh, totally. telling people we were going to do photos, and they're like, "Are you crazy? Like, mm. why would you touch that?" Right. Yeah, it's weird. Like, how many other opportunities do you think are out there? The the problem is like you. Yeah, if you were to look, if you didn't exist, and right. someone came and pitched that idea to me and said like, "Hey, we're going to sit there. We're going to be this new network," I'd be like. Oh my God, that I've again, heard this right? a thousand yeah, times, no. right? Yep. Like, do you just... Oh, and we got that reaction from plenty of people. Really? I have the list of names of people who told us it wouldn't work. So. Are you serious? Yeah. I tried to invest in you guys. Uh, that's true. I, I believe. Once I saw the product, I was like, yep, I'm in. Yep, yep. Um, but I unfortunately didn't. But uh, not because by choice. <laughs> it's a long story. By proxy. <laughs> by, yeah, by okay. proxy. I'm still in you through another fund mm -hmm. and it's all good. Um, but uh, yeah, so... Who is competition then? If, it, if it's not Facebook and it's not Twitter, are you kind of by yourself? Is it path? Is it, you know? Yeah. Um, 
People ask, I, it used to be a really easy answer. Like you could say, you know, when Path was doing photos and exclusively, you could say them. When Pick Please was around, you could say them. Like we could point to people and say, those are really close, but like all of those people have gone off and done something very different now, right? Mm -hmm. um, and you know, you can't, and as we discussed, you can't really say Instagram in any way competes with Facebook or Twitter for like what they do, right? So you start looking at it really as like, you know, it's a competition for time, right? Mm -hmm. Like where do people spend their mm -hmm. time? Um, and for that, like, you know, I guess everyone's a competitor, right? But we no, everyone's in that same boat, uh, every major service, right? We're all competing for time and, and, and a day part of, of people's days. But uh, for us, I really, I look at ourselves as our biggest competitor. Like our biggest job is, is to hire, is to build great product and is to realize that vision that I discussed with you, right? Mm -hmm. I don't worry day on day in day out about someone launching a competitive product with filters. I really don't. I worry about our ability to build the products that realize that vision that I described. Mm -hmm. That's the hardest thing. It's the hardest thing to build a company. Like, I mean, I could give this advice time and time again, which is that um, a lot of people when starting a company think they're starting a product, right? Um, and that's really kind of what you're doing, right? You're building a product to show traction mm -hmm. and you think, okay, I'm going to build a product. But really, in the long run, you have to build a company. And that's way harder than coding a few lines and, right. and building the design out. And I did all the design for our app, right? Like, I had to stop doing that and say to myself, like, okay, like, we need an office. Like, we need to recruit people and we need to think about vision and we need to think about where we stand in the ecosystem. And that's like, that's building a company. And mm -hmm. it's a very different mindset, a very different set of skills. Um, and frankly, like you have to enjoy it, right? right. So, um, you know, our biggest competitor is ourselves because we are building a company now. You know, it's not about product competition. Yeah, no doubt. Um, before we wrap things up, yeah. one of the things that I always ask uh, guests on the show is to give me uh, just one, a couple pieces of advice for would-be new entrepreneurs. Um, something that you've done completely wrong, that you really screwed up, that you're like, if I had to go back in time, you know, I could I'd fix this one thing over the last few years, and then uh, just something that you've taken with you and you continue to take with you in new startups that you did really right that you would like to pass on to other people. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I think the thing, like, what did we do really wrong? I mean, I think launching as early as you can. Um, had we launched Bourbon, like, we stayed in private beta way too long. How long is too long? I mean, it was like eight months or something mm -hmm. since the first day we, you know, coded a line. I remember thinking, oh, we'll do it next week because, like, we'll have this new feature. Mm -hmm. It was like this worry of, like, if I put it out there, we're going to get judged. And it turns out, like, you want to fail if it's going to fail, mm -hmm. right? Like, you want to get that feedback. And that fear of, like, putting something out and having it being rejected from someone is is terrible, right? But at the same time, it really teaches you, like, listen, like, go do something else mm -hmm. or focus on something else. Uh, by launching it, we were able to focus on the fact that people love sharing photos, right? Um, and that's why we focused on photos, and that's where Instagram came mm -hmm. from. Uh, if I could give any advice, it's like stay away from this private beta stuff. Like put it out there, find the people that are vocal about what you're doing, and put it in their hands and listen to them. Listen to what they're excited about. Mm -hmm. um, and then in terms of like something we did really right, uh, it was by focusing on solving problems. Uh, I think far too many startups are technologies in search of a problem, mm -hmm. right? They're like, oh, I guess Google Maps exists and I guess tweets exist, so let's mash them up and, right. and do this like geolocation tweet thing. No offense to anyone doing that <laughs> exactly. I like honestly, I made that up. But um, I think too many people don't focus on problems people have. Mm -hmm. And I mentioned those three problems before about making photos beautiful, about allowing you to share them on multiple networks. And then finally, making uploads go really quickly, right? Solve problems that people have. Mm -hmm. And we focused on three. You know, we weren't like trying to reinvent the world of photography. We were just like, let's focus on these three humble, simple problems. And that's what turned Instagram from, you know, simply yet another network trying to tackle this photos thing to something people used. And that was the fundamental difference. I think probably the first time you used it was like, yeah. you, it solved these three problems. Yeah, absolutely. So I would you know, give that advice to any entrepreneur, which is like, what are the three problems you're going to solve? How about uh, in that vein, do you think that it's, I mean, for me personally, it's been really easy to see scope and feature creep 
and then all of a sudden you're like, look at the list and you're like, wow, we're taking on 20 things. I mean, do you try? It seems like you've been pretty slow to launch new features. Yeah. Are you really taking your time and making sure you're going after the right things? I don't believe in like, I, I think too many startups, like the goal is to maximize features. Like I had one VC come up to me and was like, you guys haven't really launched any features in the last year. Like, is that a problem? Yeah. I was like, dude, do you know how much work we've done on the product to make it scale to where it is today? Right. The things you launch that end up making the difference are not like yet another feature that no one's gonna use. It's like, what can you go really deep on, right? What we went deep on was scaling to over 15 million users, which in retrospect is hopefully the tip of the iceberg, right? Mm -hmm. um, we added hashtags, right? That was a huge thing that didn't exist. It allows you, hello toaster. Um, it allows you to you know, discover- you added a toaster filter. Right? Maybe I added a toaster. toaster filter. We added new filters. We made our filters fast, right? We said, what do people love about the product and how can we make it even better? Yeah. We didn't say, what do people love about the product? Let's add a bunch of shit, right? Yeah. Like it was a very um, you know, focused effort to make the product better. That's brilliant. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, it takes a lot of discipline too. And I mean, frankly, only having, you know, back in the day, two, three engineers like made us focus on those problems. Mm -hmm. And I think if anything, that wasn't our Achilles heel. It was, you know, the thing that made us shine. And, um, you know, for that, I will, I definitely want to, if I do this again, hire more people more quickly. But uh, I think focus is key. Awesome. Kev, thanks for being on the thanks, show. Thanks, man. Really appreciate, appreciate it. it. Yeah, absolutely. Talk to you soon. Cheers.